Hello dear Terra Illumination channel viewers. This is Terra Illumination with something a little different. It's for story time, just for fun. And the reason I'm telling this story is because it's been haunting me for very, very many years. And I've never understood why this ever happened. And the other day, well, for the last few days, it's been haunting me to the point where I've decided I can't live with this thing anymore. So I decided, why not just get it out of my system by telling it? I'm not really a writer in the traditional sense, like novels and short stories. I do write, but not in ways that you could imagine at the moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I decided we're just going to tell the story and be done with it. And then if you feel like you have any affinity or understanding of some perhaps deep meaning behind the story, then maybe you might be able to shed some light on it. Uh, give me some perspective. I love doing readings for you guys, but sometimes I wouldn't mind having some perspective myself. So... The setting is kind of ye olde worldy. It's back in little old England. And it's in an old town, a very, very old town called Norwich. They used to call it Narch. And Terra Illumination was living there at the time. And that was home. Even though Terra Illumination was essentially homeless. The reality was that things were not very good. Let's put it into first person, so I don't have to keep saying Terra Illumination. Let's just say I, okay? So I had a few dear friends, having lived there for a little while, and lived through some catastrophic, very disturbing, episodes. But towards the end of the chapter of life, my dear friends Harold and Mark took care of me, since I didn't have anywhere to go and I didn't have anything. So they said, you don't have to be out there anymore. You can come and stay here. We love hanging out with you. We've survived awesome shit together already. So we know what to do and we know how to do it. We have a place over here it's basically a college campus and we got a room and we're just staying there because we figured out how to get back into college and get on the college room program. So I said, oh yeah, thanks man, I really need that. But of course, uh, this was all happening with uh, strong British accents at the time and I don't think I'm going to try and fake it. Maybe I'll slip into it accidentally. Anyway. Harold and Mark were good guys. They knew how to survive the rough stuff, but they were also intellectually brilliant. And that's how they got into college and university. And that's how I kind of got dragged into that world, even though I never kind of made it. So anyway, we would enjoy regular evenings of cooking stews together and having wholesome hearty bread in the evenings, telling our stories around our own indoor campfire. In the mornings, after a good night's sleep, uh, they would uh, sneak me into the uh, campus canteen and squish me in between themselves like I was just a regular. And from there, I could load up my tray with astronomical amounts of food. Because of the work that I was doing at the time, even though it hardly paid anything, it was very demanding. So I would load up my tray with bacon, eggs, sausage, tomatoes, fried bread, uh, fried eggs. I think I said eggs already. I like fried eggs. And then uh, a little bit of orange juice and two mugs of very hot, very strong British tea. And that would set me up. And then I would get back in the line afterwards and swipe two pieces of chunky, you know, kernel bread and an orange and that would be my lunch so I was totally set by the way regarding sleeping conditions 
I was on the floor because we had nothing else, and a few blankets. There were not even any cushions, but we endured. So anyway, I just want to get on with the story now. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. The work uh, was really filthy. It was involved uh, with the ceramics, making funky, uh, crafty ceramics. And I was very good. Uh, and my whole life was just covered in dirt and mud. And I always smelled of flames and smoke because this is all handmade stuff. It was very, very grueling, but I loved it because it allowed me to get my hands in the mud, at least feel somewhat grounded uh, from having lived a life where there's no sense of grounding at all. So typically my boots would be covered in grime and crap and I'd have to kick them off and hose them off. And my jeans would endure and my little coats and jackets would endure and my overalls would endure and that's really all I had except for an extra few pairs of underwear which we would wash regularly. And I had a bicycle. And that was enough. <clears throat> and that was my life. Now, here's where we get into the story. The ride home and the ride back to work. Six miles downhill to work, six miles up. Okay, so on top of the grueling work, uh, there was a lot of physical effort just to get home. Rain or shine, it didn't matter. Cold or hot, it didn't matter. We endured. And I loved it. I was very happy. Excuse me, I need a sip of my decaf. Oh, thank you very much, Terra Illumination. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So, to get to the point here. So I'm trying to give you like a bit of atmosphere. So imagine, just imagine it's just another cold, foggy, damp, drizzly, British night. It's very late because Terra Illumination had decided to get a very small bottle of whiskey and go out for a long walk and a bike in the middle of the night to try and understand what the bleep was happening with life. Turning around on the way back home, probably a mile and a half from where we were camping in this uh, campus, Terra Illumination is strolling down the street. It's an empty, open, suburban street with orderly apartment blocks, a few private homes, well-manicured shrubs and bushes, and a road that was very, very, very ordinary and very, very straight. Nothing, nothing peculiar. Every block, there was a street light. So there was at least a little bit of light, but not too much. Turning around, heading home, there was a creepy, crawly feeling coming through my body that there was something out of whack with no understanding of what it was. But we kept walking anyway. We, that includes Terra Illumination, I, myself, me, and the bicycle, and the weather, and the surrounding conditions. Going forward, pace by pace, uh, actually, the boots were washed off by now because of the rain and drizzle. I was kind of proud of that. My hands were still cold and grubby and kind of scarred up, but I was used to that. There was a slight sort of rumble sound in the background coming from behind me. I wasn't sure what it was. It didn't sound too much like a car or a truck because it was racing. Um, with these strange sounds, like an engine that's out of control, and I'd never really heard a car like that, or a truck like that. So I thought, well, this is just strange, and uh, let's pretend nothing's happening. So, facing forward very bravely, Terra Illumination moves onward, heading home, hopefully to tuck in, have another sip of whiskey, and lie down, Maybe having, maybe having had a little bowl of stew and chatting with Harold and Mark, and then going to sleep to start all over again. But that's not what happened. Instead, this creepy, weird mechanical sound came closer and closer from behind me. And I realized, yes, it is a car or a truck or a van or something of some kind, but it just sounded very strange because it would accelerate ferociously and then stop and stall, and then 
this process kept repeating, and I started to feel like I was being threatened, as though somebody was stalking me and had a, made a decision to do something to satisfy their urges, perhaps violent urges, and take it out on me, an innocent victim, who would have no recourse at all. I was already used to these kind of circumstances and conditions anyway, and I decided I don't know what to do. I don't really feel like turning around and facing death. If it's going to come to me, I'm just going to let it happen, and so be it. Fuck it, you know? What can you do? Uh, the other problem was that I was already very aware that there's really nowhere else for me to go. The bushes on my left on the sidewalk were very, very dense, very tall and well manicured, impossible to climb through or climb over. So there was nowhere to go. On the other side of the street, there was a sidewalk with a series of you know buildings and apartments. And I just passed one of them, and I realized there's nothing there. It's just big wire construction fences. So I decided, you know what? I'm just going to sit this out. I'm just going to take it. I'm just going to stand still. And I'm going to let this thing go by. Maybe they don't even know I'm here. Maybe they don't even care. So that's what I did. I stood still, and the sound came closer and closer. My right hand shoulder was facing towards the construction site and the wire fences, which were all kind of loose and shabby. And there was mud and leftover junk from the construction, which is normal. So nothing looked out of the ordinary. The only thing strange was this very creepy, weird mechanical sound. Now, we're at the point where shitty stuff starts to happen. So, Terra Illumination is standing there, and it's very clear that this vehicle is getting closer, and then suddenly, the sound of the rapid acceleration and screaming and roaring of the engine kicked in from way behind me, what I felt was way behind me, but this time it didn't stop. The roaring sound and the acceleration increased and increased and increased. And by now, um, of course, I was shit scared. You've probably felt these kind of things yourself when you've had to face death or potential, um, you know, impact, you know, where things could be terminal. This is normal for me, but not everybody, perhaps. I was already used to it, and I recognized the feelings. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to face into it, so I just sat there. Well, I didn't sat there. I did not sit there. I just stood there. I had very few options. I just assumed, well, by this time, they've decided they're going to run me over and kill me, just for sport. Literally for sport. So I kept my eyes open very bravely, and my body went numb. And I allowed my body to go numb, and I just accepted that I might not be here anymore. And as the sound became excruciatingly loud and painful and frightening, and coming up right up to my right shoulder, the sound changed, and there was a phenomenal skidding sound. And I could tell by now, yes, this is a car being driven by a very crazy person, and the car had suddenly veered off to the right. In fact, it veered off very precisely to the right. In fact, it went straight crashing through the, uh, the shitty wire mess surrounding the construction site. And by this time, I couldn't help but not notice the vehicle. So I just turned my head and watched the event. The car was going very fast, but skidding, of course, by now. The road was still damp because of all the fog, and of course there was this creepy fog type of one light street light. So the setting was perfect for a creepy scary movie, only this was real life. Anyway, the vehicle, which was just basically an average size crappy car, I caught a glimpse of it, with all the screaming noise it hit some kind of weird ramp and flew into the air. And as it flew into the air, what happens is, of course, the roaring engine accelerates rapidly and turns into a screaming, raging motor 
because the back wheels aren't doing anything anymore. So they're spinning violently, and so because there's no, there's no friction, there's no resistance. So the, the sound increased dramatically, but there was no uh, traveling sound. It was just the sound of the motor and the car spinning and diving. So the car flew up into the air, and of course, it's going to come down, so it came crashing down. But I didn't see where it landed because it landed out of sight. When it landed, there was a phenomenal crashing, thudding sound, and no explosion, no flames, no lights, nothing. And then just a continuous roar of the engine. The back wheels were still spinning, obviously, by the sound of it, but the car did not explode. Uh, by this time, I was uh, shaken up, and I decided, you know what? I'm not dead. This is very interesting. I don't feel too weird anymore. I might vomit later, but that's okay. That's normal in these conditions. That's just delayed shock. And so I decided I'm just going to walk over and have a look what's going on. So here we go, through the foggy mist, through the one street light. Okay, I just said that for a fact. Uh, I crossed over to the other side of the street and pulled my way through the construction fence to look down at this horrific sight below me. And there was a massive pit, obviously a construction pit for putting in foundations or something or basements or whatever. And the car was in there, like nose down into this big pile of mud and junk and rubble. The wheels were spinning, exhaust smoke was just belching out of the rear end, and the windows were all cracked. And I climbed down into the hole, and I went up to the car, and I looked inside, and I saw the body, and the body saw me. It was hard to understand what was happening. The stench of liquor was mind-boggling. I guess it was just hard, cheap whiskey. I'm not sure, but it smelled something like that. It was completely overpowering. And there was a lot of blood, a lot of blood. This poor person had their face buried into a steering wheel with broken glass and uh, arms a little bit contorted. But he was obviously alive. And I went up to him and said in an English accent, something like this, Are you all right, mate? What can I do? How can I help you? What's going on? What, what the fuck are you doing, man? And he just groaned. And he groaned and he groaned. And instead of being grateful, this is what happened. He said, Get the fuck away from me. Leave me alone. Get, get off my fucking cloud, man. This fucked up. This is all fucked up. And he started like, like sort of whimpering and blubbering. I said, what do you mean, man? Uh, do you want me to get to police or something? I'll go, I'll go back home and I'll find a phone somewhere and I'll call the police. Okay? And we'll sort this out. We'll call an ambulance. We'll get this sorted out. And he just started saying, fuck off. Fuck off! I tried to die. I've been planning this for weeks. I've been planning this and planning this. And I got really, really drunk so that I could do it. And I fucked up. I fucked it up. And you caught me. Get the fuck out of here. Just, just let me die. I want to die. Just leave me alone. And I didn't know what to do. Uh, and so... I decided the best thing to do was just honor his request. And I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave you to it. I wish you the best. I hope things, you know, fall apart for you just like you wished and you get your wish. And I'll, I'm going to leave you to it. And that was it. And I said, bless you, my dear friend. I'm going to go, and all the best. And so I turned around and I walked away. The car was still screaming and roaring. He was still cursing, but it was getting very, very blurry, like he was kind of falling apart. I didn't stay to watch. I didn't want to know if he died or not. I imagine he stayed alive or not. I just don't know. I'll never, ever know. 
That's the mystery. It's haunted me for many, many years. And part of me feels deep shame and guilt for having walked away. So anyway, I climbed out of the big black hole, through the fence, across the street, and back towards my bicycle. Nothing else was happening. No one else was in the neighborhood. Nothing else. It's like nothing ever happened. I took my bicycle and I got on it and I rode back home to the campus little place where uh, I sneaked in late at night with my key. Harold and Mark were already asleep, tucked up, because it was early winter. It was really cold. I didn't want to mess with them and their life and their world. I was just grateful to have a place to stay indoors and not freeze and die overnight, knowing that I would have food again in the morning and stew at night. So anyway, I went to bed, having cleaned up and shaken myself off and getting ready uh, for a weekend. And on the weekend, Harold and Mark and myself, we would cook up extra special fancy stews and enjoy ourselves. We would tell stories and we would write stories. We would make art and doodles and hang out and discuss life in the world and everything. And I never really told them about what happened the night before because I felt deep shame and guilt for having done nothing for that fellow who wanted to die. And that's pretty much the end of it. After a nice weekend, things went back to normal. All the clothes were cleaned and washed again in sinks, you know, like poor man's laundry kind of thing. We did the best. I got a lot of help and support from Harold and Mark. And I acted as if nothing had ever happened. And we just had fun and lived our lives. And that was pretty much the end of it. And here we are now, many years later, I'm telling you this story. And I don't know whether I should feel guilty and ashamed or whether I should feel like I did the honorable thing. I didn't really know. I still don't know. Maybe I'll never know. Maybe I did the fellow a favor and just walked away and he just peacefully died and bled out. And Because what happens when you have that much alcohol, your blood becomes very thin and it's very easy to bleed out very quickly. I didn't know that at the time. Uh, however, he may still be alive today. Maybe the contractors and construction people found him on Monday. He might have still been alive. But over the weekend, in England, in those times, nobody would have been working on the weekend. That's just how it was. So anyway, that's the end of the story. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked listening to it. I don't mean to scare you or anything. It's a true story. I wouldn't make up anything like that. And I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for listening. If you want to, just like you do with the Tarot Illumination videos, you're welcome to leave a comment. And we'll just take it from there. So thank you very much. Goodbye.